Welcome back. I'm the IntensiveD, a double board certified intensivist, here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. Today's video was a request given to me over on my Instagram page. Somebody commented on a post and asked to hear more about medications we commonly use in the intensive care unit. This video might end up being a two-part episode just because there are a lot of different types of medications that we use. So if this turns into a long video, you will see the second half at a later time. So the way I group these is just based on type of medication and overall group. I don't talk about specific medicines. I might give examples, but it would be very long to talk about every single medicine we use in the intensive care unit and also quite boring to just give you a list of medications. So. I'm just gonna talk about different groups and what we use them for and why we use them. So the first group of medicines I'm gonna talk about is sedation. So sedation is very commonly used in the intensive care unit, especially for people who are on mechanical ventilation, on the ventilator, just because it's not very comfortable to be awake and on a ventilator. And there are times if somebody is either very anxious or if their lungs are very sick, it's better to have them sedated so they can breathe along with the ventilator instead of fighting the ventilator and try to breathe against it because that is counterproductive. So in situations where somebody is on a ventilator, they might be on one or more sedatives. Everybody is different. Everybody reacts differently to different uh, sedatives. So which medication they're on may differ, how many they need to be sedated may differ just because everybody's tolerance is different, everybody's metabolism of these medications is slightly different. So we look at how the patient's doing on a particular sedative and judge the dose based off of that. Of course, there are certain situations where we might choose one over another. In particular, if somebody seems that they're anxious, we might use one that also helps with anxiety. If somebody has low blood pressure, we want to use a medication that does not have that side effect or has minimal side effect of lowering the blood pressure. So we look at it at a case-by-case -case basis to determine which medications we're going to use. So some examples of sedatives are propofol, ketamine, fentanyl, Presidex, midazolam or Versed, Ativan. And like I said, a lot of times we use these as drips, but sometimes we'll give a small dose through the IV, either when we're starting up the drip just to give a faster result. We'll use a sedative called Atomidate most commonly when we're going to place somebody on the ventilator so they go to sleep very quickly. Or if we're doing a bedside procedure and the patient's anxious, we might give them a small dose of a benzodiazepine such as Ativan or Versa just to take the edge off their nerves but not necessarily put them to sleep. Another medication that we use when somebody has severe lung disease and is on a ventilator, if they're having a lot of trouble with breathing along with the vent and we have sedated them appropriately, meaning we monitor people's alertness when they're on sedation. So if they're very sedated and they're still having issues breathing in sync with the ventilator, we might give them a muscle relaxant or a neuromuscular blocker, also known as a paralytic, that will relax their breathing muscles to assist them with breathing along with the ventilator. This is something that we do use in the intensive care unit, but it's not something that we use on every single patient. It's typically patients who have very, very severe lung disease, particularly ARDS, that we would consider a paralytic for. We also will sometimes give a quick push of this medication when we're putting somebody on the breathing machine, putting the breathing tube in to relax all the muscles, because even when somebody is quickly sedated, they still have the tendency to clench their jaw, so this relaxes all their muscles in their face and neck, well, in their entire body, but particularly the face and neck, so we can get to their vocal cords without much resistance. So the next groups of medications are particularly for people who are in a state we call shock. So if somebody has dangerously low blood pressure and it's not responding to treatment, 
then we'll start them on a medication called a vasopressor. So these are medications that work on different receptors in the heart and blood vessels to increase the blood pressure. And this is typically done by constricting the blood vessels to increase the blood flow, blood pressure. So these are called vasopressors and common vasopressors that we use are norepinephrine, also called levofed, vasopressin, and epinephrine. We also use medications called ionotropes, which help the heart squeeze. So if somebody's heart function looks like it's decreased, then we may start them on a medication that helps their heart um, contract a little better. So some examples of these medications are epinephrine, dobutamine, milrinone. So these two classes of medications might be used in somebody who's in a shock state, and that just means that they have profound hypotension, profoundly low blood pressure, and again, it's not responding to treatment, and we need to start these medications. And the medications that help squeeze the heart are particularly used in a condition called cardiogenic shock. So that means that the shock-like state is due to a dysfunction of the heart. On the other end of the spectrum, we have medications for high blood pressure. Some people might come in with dangerously high blood pressure in a state called hypertensive emergency. And this means that their blood pressure is so high that they might be showing signs of organ damage to other systems. So it could be that they've presented with high blood pressure and shortness of breath because high blood pressure can cause a condition called pulmonary edema. They also may present with a stroke or dissection of their aorta, which is the large blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart to the rest of the body. It can also cause trouble with the kidneys. So we want to lower the blood pressure, but safely and carefully, because if we lower it from very, very high to even normal levels in some people, their body's not used to seeing a normal blood pressure. So we have to do this in a controlled fashion. And the best way to do that is with an IV medicine continuously through the drip instead of just starting them on an oral medication or giving them pushes of smaller boluses of this medicine through the IV. It's easier to control if they're on a drip. So the most common one we use is called nicardipine. And this is a calcium channel blocker, but we might also use esmolol, labetalol, and as pushes, we might use hydralazine or labetalol to help bring the blood pressure down, as I said, safely and carefully. And staying in the realm of cardiac, there are also medications called antiarrhythmics, which if somebody's heart goes into an abnormal rhythm, the most common abnormal rhythm in the intensive care unit is atrial fibrillation, and particularly atrial fibrillation with RVR, which is rapid ventricular rate. So this means that in addition to having an abnormal heartbeat, it also means that it's at a very rapid pace. So if that continues on, it can cause lowering of the blood pressure and what we call an unstable arrhythmia. So there are medications that will help get the heart back into a regular rhythm. One of the more common ones that we use is called amiodarone. We'll also use lidocaine, digoxin, and some other antiarrhythmic medications to get the heart back into a regular rhythm. This is a very broad category, but one of the most common things that we use in the intensive care unit are IV fluids. And there are many states where somebody might come in, what we call intravascularly depleted or dehydrated. So like I said earlier in this video, anyone in shock most likely needs some fluids. Not always, because if they're in cardiogenic shock, then that means that they most likely have too much fluid on their body. But if they come in with septic shock, or if they come in with in a condition called DKA or the HHNK, and these are two conditions where the blood glucose is very, very high, then this person is probably also very dehydrated. So we'll give them liters upon liters of IV fluids. We also use fluids to manipulate the serum sodium levels. If it's too high or too low, there are different types of fluids that we'll give for that. But in general, I'd say most people who come to the intensive care unit 
get some form of IV fluids at some time. And we closely monitor how much fluids, including the fluids accompanying medicines, are going into a patient and how much is coming out in terms of urine stool output, if they have any tubes that are draining, if they vomit, anything like that, we monitor closely how much goes in and how much goes out of a patient because that's something we want to know what, what we call their volume status. If they have hypovolemia, lower body volume, if they're euvolemic, it just means that they're balanced about the same amount going in and out or if they're overloaded, hypervolemia. So these are things that help us determine what a patient needs in terms of treatment. Some common IV fluids that we use are normal saline and lactated ringers, and those are both what we call crystalloid, and that just has to do with the composition of the fluid itself. And there are times we also use a colloid called albumin. And of course, if somebody is overloaded, then there is a different type of medication that we would give them called a diuretic. Diuretics are medications that work inside the kidneys and help the kidneys pull more fluid outside of the blood volume into the urine. So if somebody gets a dose of a diuretic, within a couple hours, they should have an increased urine output, helping take some of this fluid off of their body. The most common diuretic that we use is Lasix, and a lot of people may also take this at home to manage volume overload. We may also use a cousin of Lasix called Bumex, but there are several types of diuretics that we use, but the most common one, and again, a lot of patients end up getting diuretics when in the intensive care unit, especially if it looks like they're heading towards the volume overloaded side of the spectrum, is Lasix. So I'm going to end part one here and make sure to come back and look for part two in a couple days. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you want to hear more. You can follow me over on Instagram at the MD. And like I said, I'll be back with part two in a couple of days.